Hello and welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, tuning in to Heathen Talk uh, for uh, March the 23rd. This is episode 38. This is the Thetish Invasion. Uh, this episode of Heathen Talk was brought, is brought to you by Sam Flegel of FatefulSigns.com, featuring Sam's Norse mythology-themed art that explores the various legends and traditions of the ancient Germanic peoples. Fateful Signs offers prints and original art for sale for those interested in Norse mythology right up to the serious art collector. We'd like to take a moment to thank Sam, uh, Sam for his support of the show and his contri contributions to modern heathen art. Please consider visiting FatefulSigns.com. Um, Sam is uh, supporting the show through the end of March, and we want, really want to thank him for his, uh, his support. Uh, you can also uh, check out his Kickstarter, uh, the Illustrated Havamal. It is currently uh, two and a half times funded, so congratulations to Sam on that. <laughs> so, uh, how's everybody doing? Uh, real quick, Toby, before we get started, we need to remind everybody that um, the bags on Sam's site are no longer for sale. Ah. True thing. So, uh, no bags. You missed it if you had. You missed your chance. Well, okay. You bad call on your part, really. Fair enough. Torn, where are we uh, where can where can people find us? Oh, uh, well, I guess I'll go ahead and point that out to everybody since I got Shanghai once again into talking about that fancy social media crap that we insist on using. I know it's great stuff. It actually lets you guys find us and listen to the endless wisdom of at least one of us. Your guess who. Uh, but you can find us uh, by going to Facebook uh, dot com uh, slash heathen talk. Uh, we're pretty quick at uh, seeing what people post there, responding to people. We uh, have a really good habit of actually posting any news we have there as well. And you can also find everything on our website, www.heathentalk.com. Um, did I get that right, Toby? You look like you're going to say something. No, you're good. Okay. Uh, we also have a, a, a Twitter uh, which I won't go near the 10-foot pole, but I know it's some. I think Lauren actually keeps up with it. Uh, for those of you that use Twitter, she says she does. Sorry, she's having a little bit of trouble with her mic tonight. Hopefully, she'll be on shortly. Um, I don't think Lauren's joining us tonight, Torin. Oh, okay, my mistake. That's right. Ignore me. It's her vacation. You want me uh, to take over from here? No, no, I got it. I, I was because I was just about to tell everybody to uh, feel free to annoy the crap out of our producer, Mark by uh, also looking for us on Instagram. And uh, now you can go ahead and say what I've missed. Uh, well, we also have a... <clears throat> excuse me. We also have a Tumblr for those of us who uh, insist on inhabiting that particular portion of the Internet. And... Uh, Lock Tumblr out entirely. <laughs> the, um, the Twitter handle is at heathen underscore talk. I find us pretty much anywhere there is a platform, and we would love to hear from you. So, uh, what else does the giant hand have to tell us? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's time to relocate that camera. <laughs> yep, Josh, all we can see is your is the ceiling. Uh, um, in addition, I'm on my to, phone, so. Uh, in addition to uh, Tumblr and all that, you can always email the hosts collectively at hosts at heathentalk.com, or you can email us individually at our first names at heathentalk.com. Um, so that's basically how you find us. Keep up with us. We're we're constantly doing some, st uh, uh, constantly got news out there. Constantly um, engaged with you. Um, we have a special uh, short podcast coming up in the in the next day or so. Um, Lauren was uh, uh, at a convention and ha sat down with Sam, uh, our our sponsor, and did a quick interview. That's going up soon. Um, but now we come to the uh, our normal tradition at the beginning of every show. We like to take a moment and um, recognize people who have done. Uh, who are doing and have done something significant for heathenry as a movement. And tonight, uh, given in line that we are talking about Thetish Belief, we're going to uh, single out and, and uh, thank its founder, Garmin Lord, um, and uh, toast him tonight 
for his significant and lasting contributions to uh, heathen theology and heathenry in general. So uh, this one goes out to Garmin. And I'm going to spill it all over my shirt because that's how I do. <laughs> so uh, we've got two special guests today. Um, we have... You skipped a step. You did skip a step. No, I was getting to that. <laughs> so I'd like to thank Brian Smith and Daniel Flores um, for joining us. They are uh, Brian is the alderman of White Marsh Thayde, and Daniel is the Hofford of... Um, Aethland Thed out of Houston, Texas. Uh, both um, well respected and um, <laughs> and um, I am honored to have them on the get on the show. Uh, Brian, uh, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, I mix I mixed uh, rum and uh, iced tea. So nice, nothing special. Daniel, are you drinking anything good? I am drinking a Shiner IPA. That's very Texan. Such a very Texan. Texan. <laughs> it was that or the Shiner Bach, but the IPA is fairly new and it's pretty good. Fair enough. Uh, Torin, what are you drinking? Uh, I'm drinking, uh, surprisingly enough, I found that Wingman Brewers down in Oregon did a Flanders Red. And uh, despite its attempts to attack me and my computer and everything on my desk when I cracked it open. Uh, I have to give it high marks. It's, uh, it's pretty fucking sour, as you would expect, but, I mean, it's a good Flanders. Josh, you still with us? What are you drinking? Uh, tonight, I am drinking um, Noir by Ninkasi. It's a special release milk stout. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. I don't know, one. man. It tastes funky. Well, you know, that's the trouble buying milk stouts in the stores is you can never tell how they were stored. That, and you just ruined your chance to get your free beer, Josh. I'm not going to lie just to get free beer. I have I some standards. I do all the time. Tell me again what you did last night. <laughs> anyway, um, I am drinking an ESB... Um, Fair to middling quality. It is the Trooper <laughs> by um, the folks at Iron Maiden. Uh, so it's not bad, and it's got an undead Iron Maiden Trooper on the cover. So that's what we're drinking, and we just lost Josh. So um, let's go ahead and... I was just going to say, with luck, he's going back to his computer. Yep. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. It's all good. So, um, again, uh, today's uh, topic is Thetish Belief, and we have, again, uh, Brian and Daniel. Uh, why don't you guys give us a little background about uh, Thetish Belief and yourselves and how you came to um, be part of the belief? Dan, How about go, you first. go first, Brian? No, no, no. Dan, go first. I always have to go first. You go first, Dan. Yeah, no problem. Um, although what led me is uh, was a less than stellar experience with Normandy. Um, but initially it was uh, – yeah, well, even the end of Normandy was better than the um, first kindred that I ever hooked up with, uh, if, if that sets the tone for anything. Um, so that kindred fell apart. And for quite a few years, the Houston folks, um, we went at it ourselves and formed our own group, more of a confederation type thing. And the more research and study we did, certain members found that that really wasn't an elder belief and, and we weren't doing things the right way as our research was leading us. Um, so we formed the nexus of a war band, myself and two Army veterans. From there, it was a troth moot. We met Lou Sancio and Dan O'Halloran, and from there, uh, I've known Rich Culver for many, many years, and he was Thadsman from the Windland Reach days. Talked to him, bounced ideas off of him, 
wound up in a Norman Fosterage. Normandy collapsed. Uh, 2004, Aetheloom was formed, and we left with full R intact on the eve of Norman destruction with heads held high and no oaths broken. So, been going ever since. Along the way, met Brian, um, made a lot of good lasting friendships, uh, met some damn fine people, and here we are just doing our thing out of Texas. Very cool. Thanks, Stan. Brian? Um, let's see here. I guess, well, I, I had founded a, a, a kindred with some friends in Baltimore. Uh, I guess that was like uh, 98, and um, we had uh, decided that the Nordic variety of heathenry, Azatru, whatever you want to call it, really wasn't our thing. Um, none of us had any kind of Nordic heritage that we were aware of. And so we uh, we kind of stood out in the local area. Uh, everybody around us had uh, modeled themselves off of the Raven Kindred. I mean, it was a very clicky bunch of people. Uh, you were either friends with Raven Kindred or you had been a member of Raven Kindred, and we were kind of like the odd men out. Um, and... Uh, we, we started moving more towards an Anglo-Saxon orientation, uh, my best friend George and I, uh, and uh, we formed an Alga Kindred, and um, it was just a slow progression. We, we saw what the Thetish were doing out there, and we really, we were really inspired by them, to be honest with you. They were kind of like our superheroes, and um, we kept saying to ourselves, oh, you know, we should just drive up to uh, drive up to New York and ask for a lucky penny and just sell ourselves in. But we never really got around to it. And to be honest with you, at the time, Thraldom, um, Thraldom was doing its proper thing and it was keeping people uh, who were hesitant at bay. Uh, and so one day this thing called the Anglo-Saxons Eldrite came about and it, it was kind of like uh, oh well we're kind of like Thadish but we don't have thraldom, we don't have sacral kingship and and we're like oh, oh okay that would probably uh, be more appealing to us <laughs> and um, so we uh, we got involved with that and we, we took our kindred as a whole and we joined the Anglo-Saxons Eldrite but it ultimately ended up being a uh, a bit disappointing. It, it was almost like a. Um, it, it was majority an internet entity, and uh, we wanted something real. So we started talking with other groups in the area who were affiliated with the Eldrite and said, you know, we could actually get together and do stuff. And um, we did, and that was the beginning of uh, New Anglia. And New Anglia left the Eldrite in mass and formed. New Anglia Thayid, and at that point in time, I was like, okay, great, I got a Thayid, and I don't know how to Thayid. Uh, and so along came Danny O'Halloran and uh, said, hey, 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 I'll teach you how to be a Thaidsman. And uh, I was smart enough and foolish enough at the same time to put my head to his knee and become his fostering um, pretty much like a year to the day that uh, Dan had become a fostering to Dan. And so... Uh, Daniel Flores and I were bench brothers together in Normandy, learning how to be Thaidsmen and how to lead a Thaid. And uh, when Normandy uh, took its dirt nap, um, we got out at the very end of that and um, went out on our own with, you know, all the honor that we could muster and uh, having fulfilled all of our oaths and that was in 2009, and we've been doing our thing ever since. Slowly growing, but uh, with a really good foundation of people. Very cool. Very cool. So, with that in mind, so the progression seems to be, and I mean, full disclosure, I I am a thrall of uh, White Marsh Thay, and uh, Brian currently holds my luck or my uh, worth. And um, he will hold my luck. Um, In these hands. <laughs> the interesting thing for me is that progression. <laughs> yes. 
Daddy's hands. Like a good uh, The progression of uh, just, you know, I, uh, I'll go out and say it. You go, well, I'm going to be Asa True. And then you kind of, you, you, you realize what a morass of, of tar pits that's, that is. It's not that it's become. Then you kind of say, well, okay, now I'm heathen. That's something, uh, that's something independent of, of the Asa True label. And then you kind of go, okay, what does that mean? And then you, you start looking for, for that identity and you start looking for that wisdom and it, it, that's what brought me into uh, selling into uh, White Marsh was the fact that I could spend the next 30 years reinventing all the things that I was I was seeing that the Theodsmen were doing, or I could take that step and and humble myself and learn at the knee, and then maybe be able to contribute to it going forward rather than just trying to reinvent the wheel over and over again. And that's something that I hear a lot about from people is that, well, the you know, um, last week in the IRC, um, what somebody said uh, the Theodsmen seem to be doing it less wrong than anyone else. And um, The rest of us try, just try and steal from y'all, so... <laughs> We're used to it. I think that's a great a great an analogy on the progression there, Toby. Um, mm -hmm. That was definitely how it was for me. Uh, when we met Dano and Lou, my first thought was, all right, we, they've got their shit together. Let's not try to reinvent the wheel. What can we learn? And then at a Harrow moot, um, Rich made an oath, and then the two lawyers present, Hunder and Dano, um, immediately pounced all over Rich's proposed symbol oath, Lawyered the shit out of it, <laughs> drug me into it. Um, we went on the we went out on the back porch. Um, Rich, Jennifer, Shelley, myself, um, the two men I had in hold, and I, I, they must have plied me with enough alcohol because at the end of it, uh, the idea was that we were forming a thayet, and rather than reinvent the wheel, we were going into fosterage. So yeah, uh, that wisdom tradition. You know, I give Danny a lot of shit. And he's earned every single bit of it. But he did know his stuff when he was long, when he was on, and he cared about his thing. And before he started putting his sword and his personal ambitions ahead of his thing, uh, the man was locked on. He knew his stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, very similar. I mean, you just come to a crisis where you're like, it's much like you said. I not as a true. I'm heathen. Well, what is heathen? It's such a catch-all, bland term that it really can't. It you can't identify effectively as heathen. And I think it was that. Well, what am I? What do I believe? And I kept looking at these people up in Watertown, New York, and I'm like, just as you said, they're not doing it as badly as everybody else. And these are really smart people. I mean, think about the people that were involved in the Windland Reach at the time. You had people like Garmin Lord. I mean, people like to talk ill of Garmin, but the man is a genius on levels that some people will never understand. I'm not saying he's necessarily a nice person, but he, he, he understands group dynamics amazingly. He understands theology in ways that I can only dream of. You had brilliant uh poets and artists like uh, Hildewolf and Elfric and um, it was just this think tank. It was this amazing think tank of these brilliant minds and brilliantly creative people and I kept looking and I'm like I, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. Oh, I got to get up on a block and sell myself and so um, you know the Wendland Reach have pulled out of heathenry and they pretty much disappeared and said we're not dealing with these people anymore and um, I had lost my opportunities, and um, the, the Eldrite was a, um, a poor facsimile or a poor simulacrum of that, and um, when the opportunity presented itself, a theodsman said, well, I can foster you, and I'm like, okay, I can do this, um, and um, yeah, I, I mean, your, your, your progression is... I see it all the time. 
mm-hmm. even amongst the people, even amongst the people that are in my hold now or in thrall to me right now, it's the same thing. I'm doing this. I feel like an idiot. I went away from that. I want what you're doing. <laughs> so that's a uh, uh, that you bring up some interesting terms, um, and and we kind of want to uh, kind of want to touch on that. How does one become a Theodsman? You, you, because it, unlike heathenry, where it's basically you stand up and you declare yourself heathen, and then must be tested by other heathens on whether or not they accept that declaration or not. But it's really it's it's a self uh, self claimed title. The title of Theodsman is not. It's it's something you have to. There's a distinct. When when somebody says I'm a Theodsman, if they're te- if they're telling the truth, there are that has a meaning uh, that has meaning to it. And so, how does one become a Theodsman? Worth, worth himself into a Theod. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that is the easy answer. Um, and down that rabbit hole you start. Yeah, we are a tradition, and um, that tradition has certain security features for lack of a better word I mean anybody can say I'm a Theodsman but it's kind of like you know I'm a Freemason well show me the signs who in, or, 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 or voodoo you know who initiated you what house are they from we have you know I mean it, we're, we're very small religious communities we're a very small tradition Thedish belief has always been extremely small uh, sect, for lack of a better word. So, I mean, if somebody were to say I'm a Theodsman, it would only take about five minutes and three phone calls to find out if they were legitimately part of the tradition. Um, so, you, and having these safeguards in effect for the tradition, um, you know, either being fostered or, uh, or or going into thrall and worthing. Well, I mean, fostering is a process of worthing. Um, you know, it's 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 a way to basically preserve the tradition in a sense. I hope that makes sense. Oh, I'm tired. <laughs> no, it does make sense. It it. it um, I think the the important things we need to take away there that it is a tradition that there are that that everybody who has learned at the uh, who has learned how to be a theodsman or. Uh, can tell you who taught them, and they can tell you who taught them, so and so on and so forth, going back to the very beginning, which is Garmin and the Winland Re- Um It all starts with being a Thaola or being a Thrall. Right. I mean, that's the, the step on the door. Mm-hmm. So the, the term comes up, and I'll, I'll be honest, um, I consider myself an Anglo-Saxon heathen, but I'm not a Theodsman. Um, and my hang-up has always been this idea of thraldom. Same in Aetheland. Uh, that's why we... It's a subtle distinction, but we ran with the word Thaola versus thrall. At the end of the day, um, it, it's just a subtle linguist shift, but the meaning is still the same, and it, it's there. It is a worthless individual. I'm sorry, Brian. Hop on in. I'm going to ramble. I'll I'll ramble on. Hopefully not like the uh, (laughs) the previous guests, but but uh, well, I was going to delay coming on this week and then come back next week and ramble. But sorry. (laughs) What I was going to say is, we stuck with the word thrall. I mean, externally, we have we have language that we use internally, and internally we would use you know, Theo or something like that. We use a lot more Anglo-Saxon real old English words internally, but externally we say thrall. And um, it's designed that way. Um, Thetish belief is not just some kind of a... It's, it's not a, a, a pin that you wear on your shirt and you say, I'm a Thetisman. It's a, it's a radical shifting of your thinking process and your learning process, and it's an intimidating thing. And so by using that scary word thrall, we kind of keep away the people who are not serious. It's it's a nice little um, boogeyman effect, if you will. Uh, thralls, learners, theos, whatever you want to put it, if you're doing it 
the right way, it's a huge investment. It's a huge investment of time. It's a huge investment of emotion. It's a huge investment of resources. We actually, I, I can't speak for Daniel, but in White Marsh, you know, a, a thrall does not pay for things. A thrall is given things. Um, it, it's a huge investment. And if every Joe Schmo who figured, oh, I want to be a Thadsman today, um, there wasn't that scariness there to keep the, the less than serious away. I mean, we'd have no time, we'd have no resources to do the things that were necessary for the actual members of the Thad. So we keep it to, to keep the keep people away. Go away. Get off my lawn. Yep, it is a it is an excellent weed weed eater for the first hmm? that the term itself. Well, I'm nobody's slave. Oh well. Bye. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll I'll you I'll never be a thrall. Well, nobody asked you. <laughs> you, have to ask, you have to ask to be made a thrall. You know, it's not like we run around slapping thrall bracelets on people or throwing people in chains. Uh, so I mean, I'll never be a thrall. Okay, great. Don't. <laughs> bye. <laughs> bye bye. We had a guy that wanted to become a Thawa. Um so I I actually put him under Christopher. It was it was great because he was an older gentleman that was an IT manager and he lasted about two weeks. Um, pulled me aside and said, Daniel, I don't think I can ever take orders or direction from anybody who's younger than me. And the pat response is, hey, no problem. You're welcome to join us anytime you want, but if you cannot, if you can't follow directions from somebody, there's no way I'm going to ever trust you to give direction within this inner yard. Adios. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Speaking personally, I found it that the 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 asking that first hurdle of just getting over yourself and asking to give up your worth <coughs> is in some level the easiest like the the process for me has been revelatory in the terms of I didn't even know what I was going to encounter until I encountered it and then I went oh oh so that's what this religion means that's what this thing means I encountered a situation I don't know, couple, uh, like six months into my into my thraldom, and what it was doesn't matter. It just it, all that matters is that I had to ask for help, and I had to turn to somebody else and ask them to do something on my behalf, and that was intensely humbling. And uh, then I was like, oh, oh, now I'm starting to understand this. Now, that's when that's really when I first took my first step. Everything else was just prelude. Now, uh, for the sake of uh, our audience, who uh, a lot of whom are really unfamiliar with Thanish belief in general and uh, you know this whole process of thralling and what it really is, I, I got a request first of Brian. Uh, can I ask Toby to talk about, in no uncertain terms, what it's been like to be a thrall without the threat of him getting kicked down any stairs? Go right ahead. That's awesome. <laughs> Please, by all means. <laughs> So, I, Toby, it's not a threat if it's a promise, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Toby, to the extent that uh, you know you're comfortable uh, talking about the things that you've gone through, you know, can you run through a little bit what what exactly it is like to be a thrall in, in uh, a theode? It's a it's a lot like uh, it's a lot like your first time at a at a uh, at a club meeting or your you know. You are you are there to watch and observe, and to and to be of service in however you can. And the thing the thing is, you can't really help you. You can't really add anything to the discussion. You can't add anything to the event. Uh, but I can pick up some trash. I can carry some. I can wash some dishes. I can ask some questions, and then you know. As that as you progress there, then you come to to really start to see the dynamic, the social dynamic as it as it exists, and then you start to make statements. Uh, there there have been times where Brian says, "Well, you don't have to do that," and I said, "No, I I do have to do this, and this is the reason why I have to do this, because if this relationship is to go the way it is, this is how I express." The, uh, that relationship. I mean, in one in one case, uh, when we were negotiating f uh, 
with um, Brian for the use of the bloat shirts. I made it a point to negotiate on his behalf and actually m made some demands of Heathen Talk as a as an organization that that certain things had to had to happen. And um, they were largely, you know, Brian had said, yeah, you can use it. And I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do for you know, you're gonna get um, you're gonna get credit, you're gonna get a shirt, you're gonna you know, these things. And he said, you don't have to do that. And I said, yes, I do. I think that's uh, that's an example of of learning to put yourself in that place. Like it, when I worth when I when I am uh, oathed into the um, into the Thaed, part of my oath is to carry the banner of Thaedish belief and to represent it outside to outsiders, and that means behaving in a certain way. And uh, speaking in a certain way, and and being mindful of that. Um, so I I hope that answers your questions without getting into specific events, because I don't I don't think that's necessary. Right. So I mean, to to kind of put it in terms that uh, we've spoken uh, in, in a lot on the show, is you're kind of essentially proving your worth to the Theod, to the point where that tribe eventually recognizes that worth. Publicly. Well, I, I'd say it's more of an issue of enculturating yourself to the culture of the Theod. I mean, but that would be part of proving yeah, your worth. Yeah, it thing. is. It is. It is. It, it's showing that you get it. Um, I mean, they, as far as I'm concerned, thraldom is basically getting you to the point where I can have you in a ritual setting, and you're not going to do something stupid that I'm going to have to, you know, uh, look up and say. Uh, yeah, sorry. You know, I mean, that's the benefit of having a thrall, and that's really always been the joke. The thrall is the fees person in the room. A thrall is supposed to make mistakes. A thrall is supposed to fuck up. Uh, it's part of the learning process, and the whole reason why they're worthless is because you, if a thrall fucks up, or if a thrall messes up, rather, I'm sorry for my cussing, um, it doesn't reflect upon the fan because, well, they don't really matter. They're, you got... You're not, you're not part of our group, and so it's a it's a safe way for them to learn. It's a safe way for them to make a mistake that doesn't endanger the luck of the Thayid. Because once you're in the Thayid, once you're part of that web of oaths, you are able to impact it. So it's a nice way for you to learn, but not be able to affect things negatively, in a negative way, rather. So, I mean, people make a, a, a lot of the thraldom... Uh, oh, it's scary. Oh, it's demeaning. Oh, but honestly, it, it really does exist, as all things exist in Thetish belief, to protect our inner yard. It sounds kind of like an apprenticeship, really. Like very much so. Very yeah. much so. <clears throat> I can see that. Uh, you know, as I've been an apprentice before, mm -hmm. I I can uh, definitely see that connection. <laughs> and a good master lets his apprentice screw up. And make mistakes because you will learn more from your mistakes than you ever will your successes. Oh yeah, I, I I've got so many stories, so many. <laughs> now the really the really rat bastard thing about fosterage is, fosterage you have all of the same problems that you do as a as a as a thrall. You will mess up, you will make mistakes, but you have absolutely none of the protections. You are held responsible from day one uh, for your for your actions and your mistakes. And because you're technically not a part of that Thayid that you're fostering under, you're basically thrown into the deep end of the pool and said, okay, swim. Oh, and by the way, you're going to have a, a couple of people who are underneath of you pulling you down into that deep water. Uh, so it's it's a it's a it's a much more difficult process and people always say, Oh well Brian didn't thrall, Daniel didn't thrall. No, we fosterage. We had people in thrall to us and we had no protection of our own and we had to learn it the hard way. And we made mistakes. Well I made mistakes. I don't know about him. <laughs> oh yeah. No. Absolutely. Dan, do you have anything to say about uh, thraldom process or Thewa process, and uh, or even talk about fosterage. 
Uh, Brian covered the uh, Thaoma process fairly well. Uh, that's that's exactly why it exists, and it does a good job of weeding people out. Yeah. If mm -hmm. a thrall screws up, you throw him down the stairs and uh, get another one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the sticking point. Uh, not throwing him down the stairs, but you know that that idea of worth, I think, is one of the in addition to the word thrall. Worth is the big hurdle for somebody oh, yeah. to get in, the, in that mental gymnastics. To, and I always – there's a uh, – I don't want to call it a pregame speech, but there's a short little delivery I give to most everybody that I've ever worthed or taken a hold oath from or heard a hold oath from. And it, it, it covers some of the darker sides of, of Theodos' belief, and one of those is a – it lends itself to a natural tendency of xenophobia. There is an inner yard, there is an outer yard, and that can easily lend itself into an us versus them atmosphere if carried too far. And in some places, that's earned. We see that on Facebook every single day. There are definitely them, and they can go to hell, and just they need to be put in a Texas bayou with a big rock on top of them. Um, there's quite a few of them out there. It lends itself to that xenophobia, and it centers around the concept of worth and the idea that your inner yards are worth. Those are the people that you love. I know I love every single one of my folk. Um, they have worth to me. I would give my life for them. Um, I'm the one getting tossed off a cliff or, well, like we were talking about earlier in Texas mountains, there's, there's nothing down here. Um, but I'm the one that's going to be bogged if the luck just catastrophically fails. But that idea that, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm y'all's friend. Don't I have worth? No. No, you don't. Not, not, not in the inner yards. Sorry. I mean, that's if, if you want that, that's welcome to be in a Thaewa. Yeah. I think that's the other big hurdle, the idea that at the end of the day, the inner yards are the ones that grant all the good things, the, the fair fame, the renown, the glory, the worth, law, that only looks inward, growing back likened it to a fence of people staring outwards towards the wild. Uh, you know, that's the, the bulwark against the chaos, and the Thayet is the, the sanctum. Yeah, I think worth is a serious um, stumbling block for people because we come from a society that says, well, everybody has worth. Well, everybody has the potential to worth. Uh, worth means to become. And... Um, you don't become like that. You become by doing. And so everybody has a potential for worth, but worth is a tested thing. It's a, it's a, it's a muscle that's been flexed. It's a, you know, we all have muscles, but until you actually go to lift something, you haven't worked. You could be big in muscle, but weak in strength. And the small guy can be very strong in strength and not be uh, overtly, uh, a, in appearance, a, a strong person. Uh, so... When you tell somebody, and, and, and so much of our, of our tradition is symbolic, but it it's really, I mean, the semiotics of the, of the rituals are amazing. Uh, when a person goes to Thrall, they're given a penny, and that penny is a symbol of, okay, this was your perception of worth. And the first thing they do is they go and lose it. They, they go out away from people. And they're basically there by themselves with their worth in their hand. And they take it and they throw it behind their back. Well, they don't always go into the woods. Some people do it outside of a uh, taco shop. But, um, uh, <laughs> but uh, I got to ask, was it a, a, like a, at least a good taco shop? Or are we talking uh, Taco Bell? One of, the, one of the best Mexican restaurants in Baltimore. And that doesn't say much to the Texan. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but it was good. You, you ruined my best line, sir. Yeah, sorry. I sold my worth for the price of one lucky penny in a Mexican restaurant in Towson, Maryland. <laughs> if I ever write my memoirs, that's going to be the first line of it. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're taking your symbol of worth and you're throwing it away. And then you come back empty-handed. I mean, you, you have to basically say, I have no worth. And that's when the process of worthing can begin. When you acknowledge that you have no worth, you can... Begin worthing. So, is this a spot where you see a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the uh, modern ideas of everybody having worth 
clashing with what amounts to a, a heathen ideal of having worth. Mm-hmm. And you get a lot of that, um, a lot of that kickback, especially from people outside of uh, theodish belief. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we use deliberately eldritch meanings of words. I mean, when, when you swear your hold oath, we say, love what you love and hate what you hate. And people are like, well, what does that mean? You know, I, I love broccoli. I love uh, I, I love rap music and I hate bluegrass. It, it doesn't have those meanings. These things have eldritch, deeper meanings. Because, you know, language is how we express culture. Language is how we communicate culture. And so when we when the tradition was founded they took a look at these words and said well what do these words actually mean and they're much deeper and much more resonant than our modern meaning and so things like worth uh you know we could just as easily say value well i have value well prove your value oh that's not such a foreign concept uh, uh, learner instead of thrall. Well, but we, we use these words because they have emotional impact upon people. It, it's kind of like that, what what did you just say? It, 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 it kind of snaps them and makes them realize, okay, I have to change my whole perspective that I've been raised with. Because it's much like the army, you know? You get in, they tear you down, and then they build you up. And they do tell you that you have no worth and that you, you're you useless. And... Mm-hmm. But they'll make you one. Mm-hmm. No, the, the concept of worth as becoming and uh, is a is a, an important one. And and the separation of worth and value, I think, is also, you know, it's it's a conversation that needs to happen in wider, wider heathenry. Um, like many things, um, Thetish belief punches far above its num- uh, weight in numbers in terms of driving those conversations forward. And I think part of that is this perception, especially from the outside, and um, that uh, uh, Thadsmen are a bunch of cantankerous, grumpy, uh, curmudgeonly, uh, aggressive um, assholes. We are. And, yeah. Say stop the love fest here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, these these concepts they're they're anathema to modern heathenry because modern heathenry doesn't doesn't grasp the idea very well. I mean, they they parrot the idea, but they don't really grasp the idea of inner yard versus outer yard. And um, you know, to to say to a person, well, you 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 have no worth. Well, dude, I'm part of the Universal Brother of Rosebros, uh, the Universal Brotherhood of Rosebros. I mean, <laughs> I have worth because I've 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 uh, affiliated myself with you, so I you know recognize me, validate me, and Call uh, brother, yeah, Hail-sa-bro. brother and sister and Hailsa, bro, and and um, it's just like Shiny and Chrome, yeah. Sh- <laughs> but I mean, it, 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 and so when you when you say. But you haven't proven yourself. Well, what do I have to prove? I, you know, I got a Thor's hammer on, and I've got a Volk knot tattoo, and uh, I watch Vikings every Wednesday. I mean, what do I have to prove to you? Well, what does that prove? And so, I mean, it, it all goes back to this whole worldview thing, and that's why we're constantly at odds with them, and why they think these things about us, honestly. And I say this from the bottom of my little black heart. We are the most helpful, the most generous, and the nicest people if you come to us with a little bit of respect, a little bit of reverence towards our ideas. I mean, if if you treat us with respect and say, hey, you know, uh, your ideas aren't so bad. I'd like to learn more. I don't know any Thadesman who will tell you to go take a flying leap. Honestly, if you're if you're sincere, I can't speak for Daniel, but I mean, if you're sincere, we'll talk with you. We'll we'll you know we'll we'll discuss things with you. I still prefer to sneak up behind you and steal your ideas. It's we're used to it. Well, so so that actually does bring up something I wanted to ask both of you about. I've noticed um, and. I'm a relatively young heathen. I've only been doing this for six and a half, almost seven years. But just in that time, I've noticed that a lot of heathens are trying to 
establish these deeper ideas within their worldview. Um, and you see these conversations going on about worth and how, how can those of us, or not just those of us, but those people who want to learn these concepts but aren't theatish. They, they, uh, someone in the IRC mentioned that someone needs to start a Swedish uh, fjord is the way he spelled it. And are there ways to adapt these theatish ideas to the other kinds of heathenry that there are? Blind to your family. I mean, if you have to start somewhere and there is no one around you, then apply the worldview to your family. Start at home. Start at the roof tree. The most you can do um, is really just seek people out and talk to them and bounce ideas off of, but uh, we are we are based on community. I think it's... I th uh, to jump in here, um, the because I, I came from a position where I did that. I spent a lot of time talking to Brian before I ever decided to make that, that leap because I had my own community. I had my, my Shire in Georgia that I w had responsibility to. And I spent a lot of time talking to Brian and and bouncing ideas off of him and uh, receiving that feedback and not always taking everything as gospel. And I, I mean, I still don't. I still will come back and say, what about this and what about that? And, and I'll still go, you know what, this, you know, what do you think about this? That kind of thing. And that, that gets into some of the other concepts that I'd like to t talk about tonight. Um, but... You can, you can do that, and you can develop those ideas and develop a, a heathen worldview, but you'll never be Thetish. And you don't have to be. Yeah. You don't. That's the thing. Thetish belief is a wisdom tradition. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Every innovation in heathenry for the last 40 years has pass through the hands of a theatsman first. And uh, that's not saying that... That's not saying anything negative about those who have taken those things and work or run with them. But every innovation, the concepts of Inengard and Udengard, those were really first encapsulated by the Wildenings back in the early 90s. Um, you know, Symbol uh, was a very different, very inaccurate drinking festival uh, prior to the Thadesman saying, okay, well, let's take a look at stuff and see how this thing was actually done in ancient times. So, I mean, animal sacrifice. I mean, we were the first to do that as a tradition. So, um, these things have all passed through the hands. And anybody who takes them up, that doesn't make you a Thadesman, but it at least, I guess, gets you a little bit closer to something a little bit less wrong. Uh, you, you could be you could be close. I think that's what a lot of people are looking for is to be less wrong than others are. But um, and this this kind of hits home to something I'm currently writing about, which is about how in this instance it would be the the idea of also true has a uh, made heathenry bland. It's kind of killed its diversity. And I think that there is a lot of learning that can be done just from the watching the way you guys do things. Because just interacting with Toby and yourself, I've I've learned a lot about the heathen worldview just in the last year that I didn't didn't have access to before. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting um, it's an interesting dichotomy, and I'd like to get Daniel's input on this uh, uh, before we we move on to some other concepts. Say again. I was hoping to get your input on the idea of that cross cultural po uh, pollination and that that it Theodish belief isn't for everybody, uh, but Theodish belief has a lot to offer heathenry if. Heathenry would just take a moment to look at what we're doing and and stop 
tell us what it stops looking at us uh, or looking at us like they think what we're doing if that makes it if that makes sense no that makes perfect sense and I think that that idea historically bears out I mean before the term reconstruction was in vogue you had Garmin's idea of the retro heathen and that's talking to Bill Lindsay and uh, other people who coined the the reconstruction that's where the idea spawned out of was the Thayets. Yeah. Uh, my brother Rich in the chat, you know, made an excellent point in the '90s and early 2000s. How many people are out there using feigning instead of bloat? Well, that came right out of the Thayets. Uh, so much of the, of the lexicon comes out of the early Thayets, uh, and that's great. I mean, not only just as somebody of Thayers' belief, but I, I'd be tickled pink if people steered themselves towards a more eldritch view of heathenry at least started paying respect to the to the worldview of the culture um, one of my long long standing arguments I was a troth godman back in the day uh, please forgive me for that um, one of my long standing arguments with Rod Landreth who was not the court, clergy coordinator yet was over theology he he wanted to put together heathen theology using uh, his religious studies background, using Christian terminology. And you can't do it. it you, you cannot shoehorn a shame culture and that worldview into theological terms that are designed to work on a guilt culture within heathenry. They are just two radically opposing views. Uh, so even if Everybody despises us, but it gets them moving towards the the worldview. I'm happy. Hey, that that just makes a a a better heathen at the end of the day. I mean, I, I just can't see it any other way. Uh, un unfortunately, I don't know if we're still coming out ahead on the aggregate there, but maybe. That's the perennial. Uh, that's the perennial. Uh, conversation, isn't it? Are we doing better than we used to? And that is the Indo-European dynamic. Mm -hmm. Form some order out of the chaos. For the record, I think we're doing much better than we were. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't occasionally give me heartburn and make me want to put a I'm an optimist at heart. I, I, I'm not that cynical. I have to think we're doing we're, we're doing better than we I think we're going to leave things better than we found it. I hope right. that that's at the end of the day, that's all I want. Well, I think mm -hmm. everybody's doing a lot better out there than uh, <clears throat> they used to be. I mean, just just in the short time I've been paying attention. <laughs> I hate to I hate to quote the guy, but Danny used to always say, "Hope springs eternal." <laughs> mm -hmm. Like a good Irish Catholic boy. <laughs> <laughs> I say, you know, the one thing to remember about uh, watching larger heathenry, if you will, uh, do its thing out on the internet is that uh, the difference today is that we get to see all of the stupid. Uh, Not just the stupid once. that's close to us. Yeah, all the stupid, all at once. It's kind of like, you know, you can easily think that the world's going to hell in a handbasket if you watch the 24-hour news channels. Well, like I said about Austin earlier, as long as they congregate in one spot, <laughs> that way we know where to drop the nukes. <laughs> oh... Heathen Talk does not endorse dropping nuclear weaponry on any city in America or abroad. There's neutron bombs. <laughs> <laughs> the views expressed by the guests on the Heathen Talk podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of the hosts. Okay, yeah, but sure. hold on a second. Necessarily. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm still trying to go through the list of cities. <clears throat> Give me a moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh. next question. Come on. <laughs> it's bad so, when the guest uh, has to keep us on track. <laughs> oh, one of the one of the first things that I I actually sat down and learned when I uh, when I sold into Thrallum was the answer to this question, and I'll, I'll pose this question: What makes a happy life? Who are you posing the question to? Our guests. I was hoping. Oh. Go on, to crush your enemy. See before you finish <laughs> the lamentations of the women. God, that took way too long for somebody to bust out. Oh. Uh, I was waiting. 
<laughs> what makes a happy life? Uh, man, I love my family. I love my folk. I mean, somebody asked in the chat, what is the Otis belief all about? Community. Uh, the, Brian's got the, the, the quote memorized. I'm not going to steal that thunder. It's an awesome one. Um, he really should lead with that from Garmin. I mean, oh. that is exactly what the Otis belief is about. For, for me, it's it's happiness is, is my family, my roof tree, and my folk. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. You know, Garvin drops wisdom bombs and uh, little emails to people that they happen to save here and there. But the Northern Path uh, is the true religion is not a journey into the self. It's a journey into its opposite. It's the journey into community. Um, you know, the, the journey into the self is is a magical idea. And it's a reification. It's it's not real. Um, my whole thing about it is, and once again, you know, you have to give the old man his credit. Um, we have we have the three epistemological thews of uh, of Thetish belief, as Danny used to call it. I mean, you know, you'll have to forgive us because we can only teach or we can only discuss the uh, tradition as it was given to us. You know, the, the, the tradition isn't really written down. There are things written here, there's things written here, but this is an oral tradition. It is a tradition that is learned mouth to ear, head to knee. And so, um, you know, it mutates, it mutates as it goes along. But um, we have the three epistemological theories, and Garmin encapsulated those in what he called the three winds. And it's a it's a little clever thing. Uh, win obviously is the Anglo-Saxon letter for the W sound, and it also means joys. And the three joys are the three things that make for a happy life. Um, and those would be wisdom, worth, mind, and wealth, deal. And those all go back to the idea that of community, the search for wisdom, the sharing of what you have, wealth deal, and uh, worth mind, which is a neological, neolism, I'm sorry, neologism uh, for honor, keeping your worth at the forefront of your mind. Um, so wisdom, generosity, and honor uh, lead, I, if you if you apply these things to your life, I don't understand how you could not have a happy life. I mean, tragedy can always befall you, and you can always make mistakes. But if you keep these three things, and I, I always like to vision them like a triqueta, they're three individual branches that all interweave upon each other. Wisdom, search for wisdom, and the ability to share wisdom that you've obtained. Wealth deal, what you have, you share with your folks, be it financial, be it emotional, be it the wisdom itself that you just obtained, and worth mind. If you always keep your sense of honor and your sense of worth, what you've actually built at the forefront of your mind, those things, those three epistemological thews work together to, to lead to a happy life. And I, I really try my very best to live by that idea. <laughs> There was a good one in the chat room. Why is the journey into the self not real? That's a good one to touch on. I, I don't know if it's – if I said not real, then that was probably the wrong statement to make. I uh, well, I was going to say it's just not – it's not as worthwhile. Um, I, I am very rusty on my sagas, but there is a Rorik, I think, Rorik the Miser, who amassed a hoard of wealth and at the expense of friends and kinsmen. For himself, and uh, at the end of the day, he was slaughtered because he had no kinsmen to back him up. I, I, I don't know of a, the only better example than that. If you don't like the Viking Age stuff or you want to steer more towards the continent, is the Wanderer. When he was alone, bereft of kin, bereft of men in the woods after everybody had been slaughtered, I, I don't know what's, what's more alone and in touch with yourself than being in the woods with you know pre technology. Uh, that that's certainly a journey into the self. And what did he have to say about it? It was a fate worse than death and he would prefer to die. Yeah, well, there there's your journey into the self. Well, I well think this... Go ahead, Brian. Uh, well what I was gonna say is when I when I was meaning that the journey into the self isn't real, it has no metric for success. It was like I said the last time I or 
one of the times I was on before, the journey into the self is masturbatory by very nature. It's masturbatory because it's, you know, you don't have, you don't have a metric. You don't have a way to measure itself. Well, I did this and it, it was successful. Well, who said it was successful? Well, well, I said it was successful. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. Well, what made you lucky? Well, I said I'm lucky. Oh, I, I did this ritual and, and the gods liked it. Well, how do you know? Well, because uh, they told me. Well, okay, that's great. You know, a community is a real thing. It's a real metric for success. It, 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 you can see the impact it has upon other people around you when you do a ritual or when you do a blot or a feign and you, you have a way to quantify or qualify that, that success. Whereas the journey into the self, it's real, but it's only real for you. And you, the only metric it has is for you. Uh, and there's no... I liken it to a Buddhist concept of enlightenment. It's yeah. completely selfish. Yeah, I'm, I'm enlightened. Uh, what you said. Good, good for you, all alone. I uh, I want to take a tack on it uh, and talk about it in the in the idea of weird. We don't say that word on this show, Toby. <laughs> Let me go find the stairs. Um, <laughs> no, I, the 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 idea that I want to present to you is that only actions and only actions that bring about effects and reactions uh, are real. So that that. The, the idea that you have an impact on reality, if all you do is focus in on yourself, it is, um, you're not making an impact on anyone else. You're not, you're not making sure that you're going to be remembered. You're not, being, uh, you're not having a legacy. We're only here for a short amount of time, and really the the only things we do that have worth are the things that we leave behind when we're done when we when we're the spear, sparrow flying through the the hall and so the uh the the community gives us a chance to really have an impact i mean we're not all heroes we're not uh achilles and hector and we're not beowulf and sigurd it, we're not going to be remembered for millions or uh, thousands of years, but I can. Uh, I remember my great grandfather's name. I I remember my grandfather's name. I remember my father's name. And if I have an impact and am remembered in that way, then I have done something of worth. And and that that has meaning to it. And I think that's a that's an important the importance of that quote. So, but that go ahead. I think that this touches on an issue that I've seen um, conflict whenever I, I run across a, a wild theadsman in a, an online group, and there's an evid inevitably conflict where I see it as this idea of the self running into this conflict of the heathen worldview, and what it seems to me is that for the heathen, and specifically from what I've seen from uh, people who are part of Theodish belief, is worth and honor and even this, this sense of immortality are not something that I, I do for myself. They're something that my community gives to me. Yes. And so the, this rugged individualism that America fetishizes runs into that, and also Truar tend to balk at it. And personally, I think that there's, there's a trend of people moving away from that and getting more into this idea of community worth. But I'm wondering if you guys see that in your day-to-day -day interactions with people, if you see this newer trend of that coming up. The problem is every time I think we're making some progress, we get a fresh new batch of idiots in, and uh, it's, like, it's like the wave pulls out and a, and a deluge pulls in. Um, 
Do I see it? Yeah, but the good thing about that is 90% of those people who are idiots and just coming into this stuff, they'll be gone in a few years. Um, and, you know, but then again, a, a new batch comes in the next day. Uh, these things are bestowed upon you by your people. Uh, I can't remember who in Thetish Belief said it, but um, they said a long time ago, it's a lot easier to keep your eye on the prize when you don't have to keep your eye on your back. And... Um, there's a lot of truth to that statement. Um, I don't have to engage in self-aggrandizing because I know that my people will recognize the things that I do for them and with them. And they don't have to engage in self-aggrandizing because they know I'm there with the pom-poms cheering them on all the way. Um, it's... It's 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 very much like Daniel was saying with the uh, Grumbeck. Imagine a palisades in a circle and everybody looking out. Well, if everybody's looking out, nobody has to worry about looking in. Uh, it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing to have people at your side. It's a good thing to have people at your back. Right. Uh, I don't understand why anybody would want to be the rugged individual. I don't understand why anybody would want to be alone and wretched. That just we're human beings. We're social creatures. The idea of being on your own, it's just, it's freaking retarded. Wolf cult. <laughs> so, <laughs> is that somebody cheering me? Yay. <laughs> Yay me. See, I didn't have to even grandize. Somebody just cheered for me. So, the concept, I mean, there is the, the concept of, of trying to be the best person you can be and to be a a, a communal member. Um, Garmin's book, Way of the Heathen, um, probably not the best book to uh, to discuss Thetish belief, but the one thing that I got out of it that I really thought was worthwhile was the concept of going into the woods and that, that, that self-withdrawal from the group dynamic for a time for a time um, do you do you guys want to talk about that for a bit well I mean I did it at one point in time when my first they had uh, when my first they had basically uh, came to an end or at least when my leadership of that they had came to an end I um I went into the woods because I, I had to reflect upon my experience and I had to really I had to really figure out if I actually understood what Thetish belief was. And I, I spent eleven months out and I didn't really talk to anybody and I, I I had to really evaluate if it was what I wanted to do. Um those sorts of things are good because on occasion you just need to you just need to think about things, and it wasn't even it wasn't a journey into the self, so much as a it was a recog it was a time I had to take away to recognize the value of the group, to recognize mm -hmm. the value of these things that we're talking about now. Um, I think it's part of the process for most people. Um, and God, that's pretty much how I feel about it. It's not necessarily a bad thing. No. But fundamentally, even that serves the benefit and and serves to strengthen the group dynamic. And yes, there. I mean, there is plenty of t room for individual worthing and and honor. But it is. Uh, um. But it is. At all times, keeping your priorities straight and keeping your head on your shoulders. For those who haven't read the book, the idea of going into the woods is the idea that at some point you have to take time apart from from the thed, from the the group dynamic, to actually just concentrate on who you are and and put your head on straight and figure out if this is the proper thing for you. And I have. I have done it. I have been in the in the woods I, before. I even had language with which to describe the event. Like one of the th one of one of the things that I think is very important is that a lot of these concepts aren't 
invented for Sayadesh belief or for heathenry in general. They're just ways of talking about very human things and very human qualities in a way that gives us a a a, uh, a way to understand and manipulate that 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 symbol and to be able to communicate and ha and find the meaning into what's going on. If you don't have a name for something, it's you have to talk around it. You have to you have to talk about it in imagery and poetry and and to have these concepts that eventually distill into names gives us a way to understand it on a on a very real level and to find meaning in those those things. And I think the in the concept of into the woods or being in the woods is a very uh, important one and one that doesn't get that doesn't get as much credit as I think it as it deserves. Fair enough. <laughs> he actually sounds like he knows what he's talking about, doesn't he? Oh, boy. <laughs> I'll take your word for it, Toby. Since 2004, I haven't had any appreciable time in the woods at all. Mm -hmm. That's fair. No, no mm. such downtime. <laughs> what, what people will inevitably find out is with the Otis belief is that the more that is given to you, the less freedom you ever have. Mm -hmm. uh, as obligation piles on, um, your opportunity for, for self narrows. So you take snippets where you can find it. Yeah, and in fairness, I had released all of my men when I did go into the woods. I, I, did, not, I, I did not have those responsibilities. And uh, the idea of doing it today, well, first of all, I don't feel I need to. I, I, I feel absolutely 100% comfortable and I love my religion, and I love my people. So um, the idea of doing it today is just unfathomable to me. Uh, I, I do have too many responsibilities, and uh, yeah, so I, I can certainly sympathize with Dan there. You don't, you don't have as much free time as you wish. <laughs> so there's a question here that <clears throat> um, did come from the audience, and so I kind of want to get to it. If uh, someone's interested in getting involved with Theodish Belief, how do they go about getting in contact and presenting that? Um, Find a Theodsman. Yeah. It's kind of like, how do you want to be a Freemason? Well, you have to go meet a Freemason, ask if you can be a Freemason. I to mean, be one, ask one. Yeah. Um, well, you and, know, in all fairness, it's a lot easier to find a Freemason than it is to find a Theodsman. Well, we never claim to be a very large tradition. Um, it, it, I, I, I believe me, I have absolute sympathy in my heart for people who are in far-flung parts of the world who want to be a part of this. Um, I really do. I, I, if I could find a way to incorporate them, I would certainly consider it. Um, it's just the level of interaction is vital. You can't... Every time somebody's tried to do this through like correspondence or anything like that, it, it fails. And I mean, I have people who are far away from me, but the onerous is upon them to come to us and to be around us. As much as you can learn the tradition from one person, you can't experience the tradition unless you are part of the congregation and amongst the other people, because I can sit there and tell you what Thetish belief is, and you can sit there and you can listen to it, but until you actually see it in action, where the things are unspoken, you're not learning the tradition. Um, sorry, guys, it sucks to be you. I mean... <laughs> it, so what you're saying is there's no online registry of Theodsmen? Um, well... Um, are we that hard to find? <laughs> I mean, granted, I might have been booted off quite a few lists, but yeah. I mean, the old adage: when the student is ready, the teacher appears. I think you just keep your eyes open, and you. It's really just a matter about understanding that student-master dynamic, that student-teacher dynamic, and no, I'll I'll use a student-master. It uh, this is somebody who's mastered this concept, this culture, and they they are going to teach it to you and that requires 
a, a recognition that the relationship is not equal by any means. And coming to that person with that recognition and demonstrating that you recognize recognize that it's uh, it's it's an important part of the process. Um, I'm a really big fan of P. D. Alspensky. Uh, he wrote extensively on the idea of the dynamic between the student and the teacher. Uh, he created the concept of the magnetic center, or he was, he was the first person to write about it. Uh, he was a student of Gurdjieff, but I think his ideas are a lot less uh, mystical than Gurdjieff's and more um, psychological. Um, the possible evolution, the evolution, or possible evolution of man, I can't remember, evolution of mankind's possible evolution or something like that. I can't remember the title off the top of my head. But he was this... a brilliant writer, and uh, I would highly recommend anybody who is interested. So you got to say something while you're holding that up. <laughs> the psychology of man's possible evolution. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, he's a brilliant writer, and he really covered a lot of those ideas. And um, it's you know it's it's vital. I mean, we keep talking about community and the the interactions between. It's the interactions where you learn. I always tell people. You will learn more about this religion, chopping vegetables for gumbo in my kitchen, than you will out of any dusty tome. And I've got several people now who can say, yeah, I cut vegetables in his kitchen, and all we did was talk, and we, I learned this tradition that way. Um, and yeah, books are, books are important. They're absolutely important. But books don't make you Thetish. Thetishmen yeah. are not... Fadesman. I mean, the the biggest thing was, you know, back we in the nineties. Books is a gut check. Yeah, back in the nineties. <laughs> back in the nineties, you know, you had all these guys who were pranced around, sage masters of the lore, and you know, uh, the average Fadesman might not be able to tell you the name of the hawk that sits above the between the eyes of the eagle on the top of the world tree, uh, but he could tell you what Frith is. He could tell you what Worth is. He could tell you. The important things of how to be a heathen. He may not know all the minutiae of lore. Um, you know, you got people who are eggheads who have all this lore, lore, lore knowledge, and they have no community because nobody would ever want to interact with them. <coughs> Get all over. Uh, <laughs> you know, somebody who's very book smart but has no ability to to take that and make it into a, a real thing. You know, my guy Rick. He doesn't know all that stuff. He instinctively understands the British belief. He comes from a family where, you know, his brothers were bikers and they understood the biker gang mentality and you got your brother's back. You know, I mean, he, he, when I met him, he's just like, oh, I understand this. This makes perfect sense. He goes, I got to use a silly word for it. Okay, fine, no problem. He's a theodsman innately. Anybody who knows him knows he's got your back, and he understands Frith, and he understands sacrality. And he doesn't have to use the words for it because he's got it. He gets it. And that's the important thing, getting it. I mean, Garvin always uses to use that. Oh, they get it with captions. That was the thing, getting it, not being able to describe it, not being able to use an eldritch term for it. So um, earlier in the chat room, our uh, host turned producer compared Theodish belief to a uh, sorority. And this led to a question of have you ever considered doing a Theodish rush? No. <laughs> no. Unless, unless you can get me in a sorority. Oh, I <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was thinking about the Pie Girls from Revenge of the Nerds. I'm sorry. Uh, All I know about sorority, I learned on Pornhub. So <laughs> if that's what we're talking about. I, I will do the rush. Absolutely. <laughs> At my age, it probably would be a rush. <laughs> it might be the last axe. Who knows? But I'm there. A rush. A rush. Um. No. 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 It's. It's too. It's too intimate of an experience, and I don't I don't want to sound you know mushy there, but it, it's it's entirely too intimate of an experience to 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 turn it into something so base like that. No. It is, it is 
apprentice and teacher or a master student kind of kind of uh, it, it has to be yeah it's not hazing in, in that sense and okay you made it through the hazing you get in no no, no. or, or th- even just a mass rush I, I, I'm assuming a rush is just where you take in a bunch of, of people mm-hmm. no 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 so uh, another question we have um, besides the do we have secret handshakes um, well, well, that's that's hold secret. up do you that's a secret I'm not asking what it is. I'm just asking if it's a thing. No. No. Because you should you should consider that. That's what exactly what you would say if you did have one. Mm. I've already got to remember three. <laughs> I can't remember anymore. <clears throat> so uh, uh speak- secret handshake. <laughs> I am a mason. So. Um. Steve Conway asks, uh, do your Theods invite people to join them or wait for somebody to approach them? I think we answered that, but the uh, uh, to make it explicit. Explicitly, um, if somebody comes up to me and says, hey, I'm, I'm in your area of Texas, I'd really like to come by. Our, our, our MO is for the wife and I to uh, go meet them for lunch or coffee somewhere, neutral, and just get a feel for them, find out if they're crazy or not at least before we uh, invite people into our home or within their homes of my reach and just get a feel for them. Uh, as long as somebody could be a good guest, um, I'm happy to host them. Mm-hmm. Bloat is about the only thing we close off, and that's mainly uh, – it's strictly for the inner yards. Um, however, it's it's just one of those things that our, our approach to, to bloat is – actual animal sacrifice, and you never know how somebody's going to react to that. Mm-hmm. So we've just learned to, you know, no guests. <clears throat> um, pretty much the same with us. Uh, you, you, you have to ask to be allowed into a thing. The, the, the onerous is upon you. Um, we're not going to say, hey, you know, you should join our club. No, um, that's not the way we do things, at least in White Marsh. Um, it's just not usually the way it's done. Um, can't say that it won't ever be that way. Uh, I think our club is pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, and, and much like Daniel said, I mean, if, you, if, if I don't know you, you, we meet in a neutral place and we do the whole art, is this person crazy? Uh, is this person uh, harboring ulterior motives? Um, get to know them a little bit, and then we just, you know, oh yeah, you want to come over? That's fine. Um, we have allowed people to be in attendance at our bloat uh, when we do animal sacrifice, but these are very close friends that we've known for years. Uh, and there are good folk, and we, we certainly will allow that, but they do not actually get to participate in the actual act itself. They stand usually on the other side of our, our Weibond. Our um, but, you know, I mean, the, but that's for people who we've known for many years and that we trust. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a trust issue. And it's much like Daniel said. I mean, you don't know how somebody's going to react when they see the red, red, groovy flowing. And... Um, uh, <laughs> I've been to bloats where people have had emotional breakdowns uh, as it's happening, and screaming and hollering, and uh, it's just not something that's very conducive to ritual. <laughs> no. Um, other questions. Um, our token Brazilian, uh, Marcel, who doesn't sound like a 12-year-old girl, I think he's a 13-year-old girl, uh, asks, are Thayad's been doing it right? I think so. I hope so. Well, we've established that they're certainly doing it less wrong. Yeah, see, they're they're doing it not wrong. Uh, I think our greatest strength is that if something pops up and we realize, hey, we're doing it wrong, we change. We'll adapt. We have our detractors, certainly. There are some people who who just don't like what we're doing, and that's perfectly fine. Um, there are some people that say, well, you know, this isn't necessarily historically accurate, 
And on some things, we're, we're not. We're not recreationist. We're reconstructionist. We're retro heathen. Um, but the thing that I think is our strongest point is there, at least in the last few years, as we've become a little bit more expressive of the theology, there is an internal consistency that spans through the theology into the practice, into these things. I mean, we don't do things just for the thrill of it. We don't do things just for the hell of it. There's a reason why we do it, and we can explain why we do the things that we do, and it all feeds back upon itself, and it all supports itself. If we're right, yeah. You know, I, at, at that point in time, the results are what matters. I'm very results-oriented, and if, if it's working and it's consistent, and it's logical, and it has impact. Ugh. And the great thing that Dan said, if we find something that works better, we'll go do it. As long as, you know, we can justify it theologically, and what mm -hmm. have you. The tradition, or the, the tradition in this sense, is a tradition of... I, I hate to use this term because it sounds like corporate speak, but I'm going to... A tradition of excellence. A tradition of doing the best that we can and then making it better every time. Yeah, refinement. Ref mm -hmm. Constantly constantly honing that blade. Mm -hmm. Constantly. Brian oh, and Rich um, have helped me reshape some of my ideas on the web at, uh, to, to such a degree that it's changed some of our, our practice. Um, so absolutely, I mean, ideas that I bounce off of, of my inner yards and, and my circle of very close friends, um, yeah. We're wisdom tradition, and as I said before, we only inherit the wisdom tradition that's been taught to us. I can only teach my people the wisdom tradition that was taught to me by Dan. And things are lost. They, there's no possible way that the entirety of the tradition, as established by Garmin, could have been passed on to Dan, and Dan could have passed it on to Daniel and I. But the beautiful part about that is, is it's in a constant state of redis rediscovery and re in, not necessarily reinventing itself, but things, if the tradition is sound, these things are going to pop up again. It might not be in exactly the same format as it was when Garmin was doing it, but the spirit of it will 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 remanifest. And if every theodsman who comes into contact with the tradition, just as much as the tradition affects them and changes them, they add to that tradition. Uh, White Marsh Thayed is very different from Normandy, as is. Ethelond is different from White Marsh as it was from Normandy, but you know we're kind of like cousins. We all have a genetic, uh, we all have a genetic, so to say, a, a predecessor. All going back to Garmin, but we're not the same. I'm no more my cousin genetically than I am my other cousins. We're all different, but we all can tie into that tradition. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, I want to thank you very much for uh, joining us. I, we haven't even covered half of what we what I wanted to cover. We haven't gotten to, to the concept of the Web of Oaths or Sacral Kingship or anything there. So I would like to go ahead and invite you guys back on for a future uh, show if uh, if you would enjoy that. I would yeah, love we can that. actually talk about the things that make Thetish Belief Thetish Belief. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. We'll, we'll just title this Thetish Belief 101. Part hmm. 1. Yeah. Part 1 is even better. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, but and you know, I mean, think about it, guys. I mean, our tradition as of July fourth of this year will be forty years old. That's a lot of stuff to cover. Mm -hmm. July fourth, nineteen seventy six, was when Thetish belief was founded. Yep. So, forty years. No, that's uh that's a. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, it's a blip in the uh. uh a blip on the, the radar. In human terms, it's middle age. It's it, so it's 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 an important date to keep in mind. Well, so I want to um, Brian. As always, it is a pleasure having you on the show. You're always welcome. Thank you, uh, Daniel. It was great to have you on the show as well. And I 
like to say the same to you. You're welcome anytime you want to be on. Um, it is that time, and so, Toby, Torin, you're doing it wrong. You're, you're not boss me. <laughs> Bye, guys. Have a great week, everyone. Yo, good night.